Folks, I'm sorry, I don't have your your uh, test yet, but I will have the grades up today, and then you can drop by if you want and pick them up sometime. I'll take them, you know, available, or I'll bring them up. But I will have your grades up today. Sorry for that. I was probably out all weekend, so I just didn't have time to grade them. Um, but I know you are anxious to see your grades, and I'll have them up there soon. Okay. <coughs> like this afternoon. So. <coughs> Any news from the weekend? No? We were in Mississippi all weekend. Um, let's see, we're going to pick up in chapter 3, and we'll continue on in chapter 3. We might even finish it today. Uh, have we done any of the clicker questions for chapter 3? Do y'all know? Have we done any of these? Yeah. Up to where? Um, With what? Just did that one. Okay, so we left. Okay, so we haven't got to that yet. So we'll uh, we'll pick back up with that soon. All right. So we've already seen Ohm's law. We're only going to deal with in this class ohmic devices. Ohmic devices are just devices that follow Ohm's law. <coughs> uh, you know that is Ohm's law is V equals I R. So in an ohmic device, largely resistors. If I increase the resistance, or, uh, or excuse me, if I increase the voltage, I increase the current for a given resistance. But some devices aren't ohmic. They don't respond in the same way to Ohm's law. If I were to plot I versus V for an ohmic device, and y'all did this in the lab, right, where you plotted the current, the voltage, you get a straight line for that. And um, let's see, so since V is equal to IR, Looks like the, the slope of this, or the inverse of the slope, will be the resistance. So the point is that we have a straight line when we plot V and I. And then for non-ohmic devices, your plot might look something more like this. Uh, for example, with a diode, we're not going to get into diodes, but a diode is a non-ohmic device. And it allows current to flow in one direction, but it won't allow current to flow in the other direction. And so that's one type of non-ohmic device that basically a diode if you have a current in one direction, it has a very, very large resistance and doesn't allow current to flow in that direction. Whereas if you have it in the other direction, then it does allow it to flow. Uh, but you just need to know what's ohmic versus non-ohmic. Let's try this little clicker question. If I have three volts applied to an electrical device, the current is two amps. If I apply six volts, the current is three amps. Is this ohmic or non-ohmic? seconds. I'll stop at 40. Everybody. Uh, let's see. This is a non-ohmic device. And the way you look at this, a couple ways you could approach this is I could say, well, V equals IR. So if I have 3 volts uh, and I get 2 amps, that means that my resistance has to be, what is that, 3 halves ohm. And that's not true down here where I have 6 volts and 3 amps. So I have 6 volts equals 3 amps times my, my resistance. And there my resistance would be 2, amp, 2 ohms. So you see the resistance changes depending upon the voltage that you have applied. So this is a non-ohmic device and its resistance is not constant. It changes depending on the, uh, the voltage applied. Just know ohmic versus non-ohmic. Ohmic follows Ohm's law. Non-ohmic does not follow Ohm's law. We're going to skip this video, actually. This is on diodes. We're not going to cover that right now. Um, so we can think of electricity like water and pipes. And often this water analogy for resistor circuits, DC circuits where I have a battery and a resistor or a series of resistors, uh, are thought of as like water flowing through a pipe. And a lot of the things, physical scenarios will apply to resistors as they do to fluid flow through a pipe. So if I have a large pipe, like a really big pipe, a big radius, then that's going to let a lot of water through very easily, right? And very little resistance in a big radius pipe. 
And if I have a smaller pipe, a little bitty tube, it's going to be a lot harder to push a fluid through that pipe. Um, so we can say then that the resistance, my notes, the resistance is proportional to these two, two properties. One is the area of the pipe, the cross-sectional area. And then the other is a uh, yeah. So just the area. I'm sorry. So it's the the inverse of the area. Uh, what if I have a long pipe versus a short pipe? Is it going to be easier or harder to send it through the long pipe or the short pipe? So let me let's do this as a clicker question. Let's say that you know I have one pipe that is this long and one pipe that is this long. Which of these, I'll call this one A and this one B, which of these will have the bigger resistance to water flow? Will it be A or will it be B? Which has the bigger resistance to water flow, A or B? That is, which is it more difficult to push a fluid through the pipe? The shorter pipe or the longer pipe? I think intuitively you know the answer. So uh, if you're not sure, just guess. Okay, maybe it's not so intuitive. So let's say I have a little short hose, right? And I want to push fluid through gas or liquid, whatever it is, a hose like this long. And then I make that hose like 100 feet long. Which one is going to be more difficult to push water through? Is it going to be the short hose, more difficult to push it through the short hose, or is it going to be the longer hose? So which of these is more difficult, A or B, the short or the long? Which of these is more difficult to push water through, is it A or is it B? Okay, good. Maybe my question on this wasn't clear. I'll stop at 104. 104. Okay, B is the right answer. The longer hose is uh, a lot more difficult to push water through. So my resistance then is proportional to the length. It's inversely proportional to the area. So if the area goes up, the resistance goes down. It's directly proportional to the length. If the length goes up, then the resistance goes up. All right. The resistance is also dependent on the material. And we describe the material by the resistivity, which is rho. And the resistance is directly proportional to rho. Y'all measured this in the lab, the resistivity of different materials. Uh, what did y'all do it for? I think you did it for like a piece of copper wire. Am I right about that? or a metal of some sort, you, yeah, just a piece of wire, uh, where you measured the dimensions, I think, of the material, and then you measure the resistance in a circuit, and then you can calculate what the resistivity is. The resistivity is just, it's a description of a material. So, for example, two different materials will have different resistivities, copper and wood. Which of those has the higher resistivity, the copper or the wood? The wood has a much higher resistivity because it resists the flow of electricity a lot. So the resistivity just describes the material. So we can take these three relationships and then we get an expression for the resistance where it's R equal rho L over A. So you remember how with capacitors we had two different ways to define the capacitance? We could say that C was equal to Q divided by V or we could say that C was kappa epsilon naught a over D. We have those two different ways. In a similar way for resistors, we're going to have two different ways to find, to find or define the resistance. We can say that R is equal to V over I. That's from Ohm's law. Or we can say that R is equal to rho L over A. There is no equivalent to dielectric with resistors. It's just that rho L over A. So we'll see some questions. In fact, I'll show you some in just a second where we'll use those two relationships in tandem in a similar way as we did for the capacitors to sort of explore the resistance. Let's try these. Two wires A and B are made of the same metal. And so you should read that as saying something about the resistivity. They have equal length, L, but the resistance of wire A is four times the resistance of wire B. How do their diameters compare? So we're looking here at the diameters. Remember that the resistance is rho L over A. 
the resistance of wire A is four times the resistance of wire B. And so now I want to know what is the diameter of A in relation to the diameter of B. Be careful here, we're asking for how the diameter is compared, not the area. So think about how the area is related to the diameter. Or if you want to think of it in terms of radius, that's fine too. So diameter and radius are, are uh, linearly related. I always like to approach these questions by first getting rid of a bunch of the answers. Because I know I can either get rid of these three or I can get rid of these three, depending upon whether the diameter of A is, is bigger than the diameter of B, which would be this case, or the diameter of A is smaller than the diameter of B. So first ask yourself that question, and then ask yourself by how much is it bigger or smaller than the diameter of B. Let's stop for about five seconds. I'll go to one one fifty two. Now let me let me help you out a little bit here. So um, the resistance of wire A is four times the resistance of wire B. So does that mean that wire A is gonna be small or does that mean that wire A is gonna be big? Now remember, small devices have a large resistance. It's really hard to put electrons into a small area and shove it down a small nickel wire. Whereas if I have a really big wire, like a big pipe, it's really easy to shove electrons down a big pipe. It's just there's not as much uh, resisting. So if the resistance of A is four times bigger than the resistance of B, does that mean that the diameter of A is going to be bigger? Or does that mean the diameter of A is going to be smaller? Okay, so from that, you can eliminate at least three answers. Okay, I'll go ahead and stop at 305. Okay, good. So D and E are definitely the right answers, one of those, either D or E. But now we need to figure out, well, gosh, is it half dB or is it a quarter dB? Oh, and D and E are definitely, those are definitely the right answers because the resistance of wire A is really big. That means that that wire A is going to be really thin, really uh, has a small area because our resistance is equal to rho L over A. And so if our area is big, that means the resistance is small. But here, in fact, we have a big resistance, which means our area is small. Okay? Just like water flowing through a pipe, a little bitty thin pipe is going to be is going to have a lot more resistance than a big pipe. So now we want to figure out, well, gosh, by how much is it smaller? So if we were talking about area, that is, if we were instead asking how do the areas compare? The answer would be uh, would be E if we were talking about area. But here we're instead asking about diameter. And remember, diameter, or rather area, is equal to pi r squared. Or you can think of it as pi over 4 diameter squared. Those are both uh, expressions for the area of a circle. And so if I have a diameter that is half the size of another, then I'll have an, I'll have an area that is a quarter the size. So our answer then is going to be D, that our diameter is half that of DB. Because not only do I have an inverse relationship between the resistance and the area, I actually have an inverse relationship, an inverse square relationship, rather, between the resistance and the diameter. So I have this inverse relationship where if I have half my diameter, 
I'm going to have four times the resistance. Okay. We'll see some similar questions to that. We'll get some more practice on that in just a second. Let's try this one as well. This is a really nice way to figure out unknown metals, just like you did in lab, actually, where you measure the apply voltage, measure the current, and then calculate the resistivity of the metal, and then compare it to own values for resistivities. So let's try this. You're just calculating your resistivity. Remember our expressions for Ohm's law and our resistance like this. You're just trying to find the resistivity and then you'll compare it to one of these known resistivities. We'll do about 10 more seconds, 220. Two 220, just guess if you're not sure. All right, awesome, D is right. Here, I first have to find the resistance. My resistance is V over I. Uh, v is 1.4 divided by my current, which is 20 amps. Is that 0 0.07, I think? Is that right, 0 0.07 amps? Yeah. Uh, and then, <coughs> now that I know my resistance, I solve for my resistivity. That's going to be RA over L. That's just solving this for the resistivity. And you find that it's equal to using, oh, this shouldn't be amps, this should be uh, ohms, rather. It's going to be 0 0.07 ohms times your area, which is this value, divided by the length, which is one meter. And you find the resistivity, which is going to be 5.5 .5 times 10 to the minus 8. That's in ohm meters. And then you just go through and you find that it's equal to the tungsten. So as I said, a nice way if you have an unknown metal to determine what is that metal. There are other ways to determine it, but this is a, a pretty accurate way to determine your metal. And in your various handbooks, you can find tables of all the resistivities of metals and their alloys and what have you. And as you can see also, the resistivities are quite different, which makes it a lot easier to distinguish between different metals. Okay, let's do a few more quick questions while we're here. Okay, this is just like the one that we did, so I'm going to skip this one, but let's try this one. A wire, so if you didn't get it on the previous one, if you want to mark the answer, it was uh, 1 half dB on 3.3a. It's just like the one that we just did. All right, let's try this one. A wire of resistance R is stretched uniformly, keeping its volume constant until it is twice its original length. So if you take a piece of metal, you stretch it out 
I mean, this, you're going to stretch it out. Keeping the volume constant means that it'll get longer, but it'll also get thinner. So if, as you do that, what happens to the resistance? Stretch out this piece of metal, keeping its volume constant, length gets bigger. What happens to the resistance? All right, we'll stop in uh, five seconds, one fifteen. Let's see. So a couple things are going to happen. I have this, say, a cylinder of wire, and then I stretch it out so that it's twice as long. So now my length has gone to 2L. And now I also want to ask myself the question, what happened to my area? What happened to my cross-sectional area? Well, as you know, the volume in general is equal to the area times the length. That's just in generally true that if I have a material, a cube, right, it's the area of one face times the length of the cube, or the rectangular prism, uh, a cylinder, it's the pi r squared times the length of the cylinder, it's always going to be the cross sectional area times the length. And so here, if my length becomes twice as long, I have a 2 here, then I have to have a 1 half here in order to keep my volume constant. So if r is rho L over A. My length is getting twice as big. My area goes down by a factor of half. So that means my resistance is going to increase by a factor of four. So here E is the right answer. You, those of you that put D were thinking, well, the length gets bigger by a factor of two. But this whole deal that the volume is constant is also important. Because not only is the length increasing the resistance, but by changing the area, that increases we have this dependence on the length and on the area for the resistance. So if you ever find yourself stretching out a metal, remember that your resistance will increase not only because of the increased length, but also because of the decreased area. Uh, we'll come back to this. All right, so. Let's sort of return to that water analogy. If this helps you, great. If not, that's fine too. But I find that it helps me to sort of think about resistors, especially when we start seeing them in parallel and series, and how they interact with one another. They interact a little bit differently than, than uh, capacitors did, but also similarly too. Uh, so we can think of a, of a circuit as like a, a water circuit, like one of those, uh, I don't know, like a lazy river where you have the water that's being pushed through a, through a circuit or through a, a pipe or through a, a river or whatever. And you can think of it as your battery, which is pushing your charges through the circuit, that we can think of it as like a paddle wheel. So it's this paddle wheel that gives energy to the water as it travels through this, this lazy river. And then we can think of the resistor as being a narrow section of that circuit where the water actually will begin to face some resistance as it travels through uh, through your, your river. And when you have resistors in parallel, then you'd have a look like this. Uh, this would be a big resistor. This would be a small resistor. And so in our water analogy, I'm going to have a small cross-sectional area here so that my, my water will face a big <coughs> resistance that will resist the flow. And then over here, I'll have a big cross-sectional area so that I'll have a small resistance as the water tries to flow through there. Now, which of these resistors, or which of these pipes, rather, do you think will get more current or water flow? Let's just try that as a quicker question. So let's say that I'm going to call this one A and this one B. Which of them, A or B, will get more water flow? Will it be the one with the big resistance, or will it be the one with the small resistance, the bigger pipe on the bottom? 
Okay, awesome. I'm going to stop at uh, 6, 17. Okay, good. B is right. This, uh, this smaller pipe, the smaller resistance, the bigger pipe, will get more of the water flow, or if I'm thinking in terms of circuits, more of the current. So the smaller resistor gets more current flow. This is where we get this idea of electricity will take the path of least resistance. And when we get into combination circuits in the next chapter, for DC circuits, direct current circuits, we'll use that idea a lot where we'll think of where will the current go? Well, the current's going to go into the place where there's the least resistance. Y'all heard that saying, the path of least resistance? That's what it comes from, is uh, from charges and, and the path that they will take. All right, so one more thing in this chapter. And as I said, this chapter really sort of just dives into chapter four. So we're going to see all these things again. The definition of current, the Ohm's law, and then also power and electrical energy. So batteries convert chemical energy to electrical energy. Which is then converted to whatever it is that you're doing. So uh, that electrical energy can be converted to mechanical energy. For example, if you're using like a little motor, you can convert the electrical energy into turning some turbine or whatever it is that you want to turn. Or often uh, thermal energy. Often we'll convert electrical energy to thermal energy for our various heating purposes or cooking or whatever. <laughs> But it's useful to be able to describe the amount of electrical energy that's provided by a circuit. So if you remember, our delta PE, our change in potential energy, was equal to Q times delta V. Uh, this is really just based on our definition of voltage. Remember, voltage is equal to energy per charge. Our delta V is equal to our delta PE over Q. So nothing new here. This is just our definition of potential. That our potential energy is Q times delta V. And then, if you remember, power is energy over time. We discussed this last time. It was uh, when we did work, right, work over time, the power was that work over time, which was measured in, joule, in watts or joules per second. Uh, so our energy then is Q delta V over delta T. But if you remember, this Q over T is our definition of current, that our charge per unit time is current. So then we can describe our power as just I times V. Or often you'll see it as V times I. So this applies to any electrical device. In fact, we'll see when we get into DC circuits, which is the type like, you know, you're, you're playing around with that in the lab, uh, that it applies to those types of circuits. It also applies to alternating current, which are the, the types of things that you plug into the outlets here. We'll get into AC electricity later in the semester. But for a while, we're just going to deal with some DC electricity. But this, this holds at the power of a device. The unit of power is the watts. And if you remember, we discussed this uh, one watt, if we abbreviate as a capital W, that that's equal to one joule per second. And that's in your basic SI units, uh, that's going to be, what is it, kilogram meter squared per second cubed. Is that right? MV squared. Yeah, that's right. Kilogram meter squared per second cubed. All right. That is right for the units, right? Yeah, energy is MV squared, so it's kilogram meter squared per second squared, and then an extra per second. Yeah. Uh, you'll see on your equation sheet, in fact, if you look on your equation sheet, We have a 
couple different expressions for power. Uh, we have P is equal to I times V. And then we have these additional expressions, I squared R and V squared over R. Those are sometimes useful, and so they're nice to have, but they come about pretty easily. We just get them by substituting Ohm's law. So we know that P is equal to VI, and if we substitute in for V, I times R times I, then we get the first expression, which is I squared times R. And then also we could say P is equal to V times V over R. That's just substituting in for I from Ohm's law. And so that's V squared over R. You'll see when we get into the concept test and work various problems how these alternate expressions for power can be useful. Because they will take into consideration things that hold constant. So say I have a circuit where the voltage is changing but the resistance is constant, then I might use the latter. Uh, but we'll see that when we get to it, when, how these can be useful. All right. Don't bother memorizing it. They are on your, on your equation sheet. But, you know, at the very most, you probably just want to know this so you have it, you know, tip of your tongue or whatever. All right. These are just some sample MCAT questions. We'll just work through them. They're pretty simple. But if I have a current of one amp that flows through a circuit for five seconds, how much charge is flowed? <laughs> Give you a second to work through that. Don't forget your definition of current. And then also, in addition to how much charge is flowed, I'd like to know how many electrons are fast in a given in that time. All right, so our current is Q over T. Uh, I have a current of 1 amp, Q over 5 seconds, so Q then is equal to 5 coulombs. Remember an amp is equal to a coulomb per second, so if I multiply an amp times time, I get coulombs. If I wanted to know how many electrons it passed in this time, what would I do? How would I convert this 5 coulombs into electrons? Five coulombs consists of how many? Well, and actually, it's where I think of it in terms of protons, but the process would be the same. If I wanted to determine how many charges make up that coulomb, how would I do it? That's right. Yeah, divide it by the fundamental unit of charge, which is the charge of a proton or an electron. So here, if I want to know the number of protons, I would just say. 5 coulombs divided by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. And that would be whatever it is. I don't have it written down. You can see some questions, some simple questions on the test next time when it comes up. I don't even remember when it is. Do you all know when the next test is? Let's just take a... When is it? The 6. Okay, that seems far away, but notice that we do have spring break in there. So here's the 4. So we really only have eight or nine class meetings. Alrighty? So we have spring break here. Just coming up soon. Two and a half weeks. It's not really that soon, is it? Okay. Yeah, Brandon? Huh? Oh, for a proton? Yeah, I guess you could write proton. I usually write it as an E. Like, usually... I don't know, they write proton as P plus? Yeah. I've seen it as E plus as a proton and E minus as electron. But whatever you want to do, I don't write here. Okay, that's fine. I'm going to write E plus. Then. Okay? <laughs> okay, so R is for two identically shaped conductors on the ratio of one to two. So how much, what should their resistivities be? <laughs> the ratio for the resistivities. But what we're saying is that R1 to R2, that this is equal to 1 to 2. So what must be the resistivities? Rho 1 to Rho 2, what must that ratio be? Is it going to be the same as the resistance? Will maybe be 2 to 1? Is it an inverse relationship? Will it be 1 to 1? Uh, 
one to four, four to one. What is the relationship of the resistivities? In these, as with all these problems, you want to go back to the original expression. R is equal to rho L over A. And you can see here that the resistance is directly proportional to the resistivity. So how will the relationship between the resistivities differ from the resistances? Or will it be the same? It is going to be the same. Right. So the resistivity will have a relationship of 1 to 2 as well, because I have this linear relationship between R and rho. Okay, let's look at this. We're going to come back to transformers, and we'll deal with transformers quite a bit when we get to AC electricity uh, and how they work and what they do. But for now, let's just look at it uh, in terms of, I don't know, energy or whatever. In your house, you have 100, 120 volts or whatever that run through the lines in your house. However, out on the street, those lines have about 3,000 volts-ish, 1,000 volts or more. Uh, and then further, the big transmission lines that go across the country, those have tens of thousands of volts. And so we have to have some way in order to get the electricity from 3,000 volts down to 100 volts. And likewise, those little things that you plug in to charge your, your whatever, your cell phones, or, oh no, it's your cell phones. Those big blocky things that you plug into the wall, you know what I'm talking about? The big blocks, those are transformers too. And what they do is they take 120 volts and they drop it down to say, five volts or ten volts or whatever it is that you need to charge your device. So these are called transformers. You can either have step up transformers. Those are transformers that take a low voltage and step it up to a higher voltage. Or you can have step down transformers. Those take from a high voltage and drop it down to a lower voltage. We'll get into that in a later chapter so don't sweat it too much. But you must be wondering, well, this doesn't seem right because voltage is really a measure of energy. And if I can have this device, which, you know, outside your house is just a big metal can, basically, uh, on, on the poles that you have, those big transformer cans, they're just a big can filled with oil with some metal inside it. They don't really have any gen power generating ability. They're not generators. They don't produce energy in any way. All they do is they change the energy from your transmission lines outside your house to when it comes down into your house. So you must be thinking, what are you thinking? Where does the extra energy go? Or if you're adding energy, where does the extra energy come from? In the case of the step up transformer, where I'm increasing the voltage. But is that puzzling to you? Have you ever thought about this? Where does that energy come from? That's right. You just modify either your V or your I. So with our power in these transformers always remains the same. However, in a step-up transformer, I'm increasing V, and at the same time, I'm increasing I. So in these really high-voltage transmission lines, I have very little current. My voltage is really, really high, and my current is really, really low. Uh, however, in your house, where I have a really, really low, or a relatively low voltage, I have a high current. So. You know, if I have these lines coming into my house, out here I have 3,000 volts, and then here I have 120 volts, up here I'll have a low current, and in here I'll have a high current. We'll talk about how that works, but if I have a transformer, what is this? Is this a step up or a step down transformer? This one, V out, is, is three times bigger than V in that's a step up because V out is bigger. It's stepping up the voltage. What is going to be the ratio of I out and I in? So V out over V in is equal to 3. What is I out over I in going to equal? It's going to be 1 third, right. So my current the ratios of my current are inversely related to the ratios of my voltage. You can see something like that in multiple choice. But again, well, after we do magnetic fields and stuff, we'll come back to this when we get to AC electricity. Because that's, that's one of the reasons we use AC electricity is the ability to step up and step down the voltages.
which allow us to transmit at very great distances. All right, let's try this quick test. Which light bulb in your house draws more current, a 40 watt or a 100 watt bulb? Now the thing about your house, and we'll get to this in chapter four, but one of the key things about your house is everything operates at the same voltage. Everything in your house operates at the same voltage. It's a parallel circuit, that's why it's laid out that way. So I have a 40 watt that operates at a certain voltage. Does it have more or less current than a 100 watt that operates at the same voltage? No, we'll talk about that. In your house, you actually have two lines that come into your house, or you have three lines that come into your house. One operates at 120 volts, the other operates at minus 120 volts, and then the other is a neutral or a ground. And so your dryer takes those two, and the difference between 120 and minus 120 is 240. So that's far. Some each 110 and minus 110 is 220. In fact, that's why if you look at your dryer drawing, it has, it has more ponds on it. Because it has the two hot wire and the neutral wire, and then it just has a ground. That's why your dryer operates differently. Your dryer, your stove, and your hot water heater and stuff. All right, just a few more seconds. 124. P is right. A couple ways you can think about this. Uh, P is equal to VI. This is probably the easiest way. If P is big, that means I has to be big too. Or you can think about which one's brighter, right? The 100 watt bulb is brighter. If it's brighter, that means it just needs more energy. And so if it's brighter, then it has to have more charges because the charges carry that energy. And if it has more charges flowing through it, then that means it has more current. Either way you want to think about that's fine. Let's try the next one. What is the power dissipated across this resistor? If you finish this one, go on to the next one. Five more seconds. I'll stop at 108. 108. Okay, awesome. A is right. A uh, couple ways to do this. Easiest way, since you have R and V, you could say P is V squared over R. And that's 150 squared over 50. 3 times 150 is 450 watts. RP wanted, you could go back to that P is equal to VI, but to do that you'd have to know the current, and I is V over R, or 150 over 50, that's equal to 3 amps, so it would be 150 volts times 3 amps, which is also 450. All right. Remember, this is just a substitution of Ohm's law into the power equation. So this is that's what you're doing here. You're just substituting Ohm's law in to get the power. But the answer is 450. And then let's try the next one. With that, this is the same situation. How much energy is dissipated in three seconds? If I have a 450 watt uh, device, wasn't it 450? Yeah, 450 watt device. How much energy is dissipated in just three seconds?
Only about five more seconds. Stop at 55. All right, B is right. Remember our power, our basic definition is that it's energy over time. So if I want to know the energy, it's just the power times the time, which is 450 watts or joules per second times three seconds, which is going to be 1350. Okay, so not a whole lot in this chapter. We just saw Ohm's law. Let's just sort of recap everything. We saw Ohm's law, that's that V equals IR. We saw the expression for resistance, which is rho L over A. And you'll certainly see some questions regarding Ohm's law and resistance, uh, both multiple choice questions and some free response. Though we're going to use both of those when we go into the next chapter. And then power is VI, R also V squared over R, R also I squared R, either one of those you want to use. Um, I think that's it. There are a few questions in your homework. Like, for example, how much things cost and what have you. Uh, you should go through those. There are only like four or five questions, but you should go through the homework questions. So I think we have a few more clicker questions. So let's finish up these. When you rotate the knob of a light dimmer, what is being changed in the electric circuit? You know what I'm talking about? Like in your dining rooms, you have a light dimmer switch, you change it, and it changes the brightness of the bulb. Which of what is being changed in the circuit here? The power, the current, the voltage, A and B or B and C. <coughs> All right, so a few more seconds. Stop at thirty seven. Okay, D is right. Awesome. Uh, so you are changing the power. You know you're changing the power because your light's getting dimmer and brighter. So you're adjusting the amount of power that's, that's going through that light bulb, but you're also changing the current. Actually, you're changing another thing, too. Does anybody know what you're changing otherwise? What's that? The resistance. You're changing the resistance. So next time you try it, you're a little quick. Listen, when I was a kid, this is just an aside. When I was a kid, my mom, she cleaned houses like for a living. And so in the summertime, I get to go with it to all the houses. And man, it was so much fun for a little kid because it's like the rich people. I mean, it's okay if you have somebody clean your house. Like, we have somebody come clean our house now, but uh, I don't really think it was the rich. But it was like visiting the rich people. And they would have cable TV, and they would have like stairs in their house that you could slide down and bump your, you know, on the stairs. Some of them, one lady had a swimming pool, and you see her let us go swimming in it. But I remember also that being really enamored that some of these people, like the rich people, they had dimmers in their dining rooms. And I would just go in there and play with a little dimmer switch. So you can go play with the dimmer switch if you're one of those rich people. <laughs> it's okay if you have a dimmer switch. Like, it's okay. We don't have a dimmer switch. So. Oh, and the voltage doesn't change because the voltage in a household is always constant. It's just set up that way. We'll talk about that. So two light bulbs operate at 120 volts. One has a power rating of 25, while the other has a power rating of 100. Which has the greater resistance? The 25 watt, the 100 watt, both the same? Or does the resistance just not really come into play at all? This is a little trickier. You can think about your relationship or think about, you know, what does it mean to have a lower or a higher power? And how does that affect the resistance? Just a few more seconds. I'll stop at 48. 48. And I think we have one more. <coughs> hey, very good. A is the right answer. Uh, the 25 watt bulb, you can think of it in a couple different ways. P is equal to V squared over R. So the one 
with the lower res power has the bigger resistance. Or you can just think of it in terms of, uh, well, gosh, the lower powered one doesn't have as much current, right? That's why it has a lower power, fewer charges going through it. So if it doesn't have as much current, then it must resist the flow of electricity more. And so the 25 watt bulb has a much higher resistance. The more the power, the lower the resistance. <laughs> And two space heaters, those operate at 120. Heater one has twice the resistance. Which one will give off more heat? All right, just a few more seconds. Let's stop at 28. Okay, good. Uh, the one with the lower resistance will give off more heat. Listen, you ever looked in your little bathroom heater? Look at it when you go home. It's just a wire. It's just a coil of wire. It has a very, very low resistance. So it shoves a lot of current through that wire. That's what makes it heat up so much. That's also why they're so expensive to operate because they just draw a lot of energy. Okay? Y'all have a great day. I'll see you on Wednesday. And I will get those grades out today. I'll send you an email when I post them. I'm very, very sorry. Party. Oh, one